your face tells a story. In fact, uh, all of the major organs of your body have a very important task to do. And uh, when there's a weakness anywhere in the body, you can read it all over the body, right? That, uh, that uh, because uh, all of our internal functions are so important, when there's a weakness, it's not um, uh, going to uh, simply be an internal weakness, but it's going to show up externally. And it can show up with uh, chronic uh, mood patterns and that, um, especially on the face, will uh, show up as the, uh, in, the, in the muscle tension and all kinds of ways um, on a person's face. Imbalances in the blood will show up in the skin. Uh, we'll see things in the eyes and the lips. And, uh, and all of this is important data uh, so that you can assess uh, what's going on internally, either for yourself or uh, in your clients and, and, and even in your friends, right? So it's uh, helpful and, uh, and compassionate to understand and know what is going on uh, in, with your friends. And, uh, and that gives you the opportunity uh, for greater forgiveness. Of course, that can be misused as well, right? You could uh, use it against them and that's, uh, that's not good. So there's always a, when you're learning as an Ayurveda practitioner uh, assessment and diagnosis using the five senses, uh, there's always a uh, an ethical responsibility as well, not to, um, you know, look too uh, deep into a person who, you know, that where that might be an invasion of their privacy. Uh, so I won't say much more about that, other than it is a powerful tool, and uh, and it can uh, really help in your clinical sessions. So my name is John Immel. I'm the director of Joyful Belly. I, I have my video on here. Um, and, uh, and, the, and the director of the school. And today's presentation is, um, uh, is a, a snippet of a presentation on face assessment and diagnosis from uh, the Fundamentals of Ayurvedic Medicine course, a two-year uh, course in Ayurveda that certifies our uh, students to become clinicians. Uh, so uh, Joyful Belly, the Joyful Belly School of Ayurveda is a clinically focused Ayurvedic school. We are looking at, uh, at what can we, how can we use Ayurveda and Ayurveda's biocharacteristic theory of medicine uh, to improve clinical outcomes uh, for uh, our clients and, uh, and bring uh, better quality of life to the public, not just through direct meeting with clients, but also advancing Ayurveda's biocharacteristics theory of medicine to uh, uh, Western uh, medicine and helping them understand the rationale and the common sense approach of Ayurveda. Uh, we're, uh, our programs are, are quite rigorous and challenging uh, for students uh, with a focus on quality teaching and academics. My background, just so you understand a little bit about me, um, I uh, uh, studied mathematics at Harvard University, and I bring an analytical, uh, a sharp analytical uh, bent to, uh, to Ayurveda, which I think is uh, extremely helpful to folks uh, who may have been presented a more mystical version, uh, a, 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 an analytical and practical um, uh, understanding of Ayurveda can help you uh, to understand why Ayurveda makes common sense and the rationale behind it. And I think that's very grounding and, uh, and very helpful, especially uh, for uh, folks that are looking for more evidence-based um, practice. Uh, our school specializes in food, herbs, digestion, and nutrition. And uh, we offer three main certification programs. The Fundamentals of Ayurvedic Medicine, where today's presentation comes from, a two-year clinical training program that starts in nine days. Um, we have uh, uh, a course uh, sp specializing in clinical Ayurvedic herbalism, and that uh, is presenting the uh, herbal medical model of both uh, Chinese medicine and Ayurveda in that course, a great synthesis between those two systems, um, and using that approach to analyze both 
uh, Western uh, herbs and the Ayurveda Materia Medica. Uh, also, we have a specialization course in mastering Ayurvedic digestion and nutrition, which is my clinical specialty. All right, good. Let's get on to talking about the face. Visual examination is one of the three main methods of Ayurvedic assessment, along with palpation and questioning the client. Um, and, uh, and so uh, what you see, what, what, our, a main part of our examination is what we see when the client walks in the door. And, uh, and that in, in Western medicine, you hook someone up to, uh, you uh, draw some blood and you put the blood in a machine and test their blood. That's their main diagnostic tool. Um, our main diagnostic tool in Ayurveda is looking at someone. Um, and then we see what kinds of imbalances we uh, study and learn how to interpret signs uh, externally and how that uh, indicates what's going on internally. The very first thing you notice when you see a person is their face. And so it's a natural place to, uh, to direct our attention. In addition, there's a lot going on on the face. Your eyes are there, your eyebrows, your, your mouth and your lips. And all of that is, uh, is commu are, are communication tools. And we can see your ears and uh, all, uh, the hair. Uh, there's just a lot of data um, uh, in the face and a lot going on there. Uh, so it, not only is it visible uh, and something you can see, but it also uh, g gives a lot of information. So it's a natural place where Ayurveda is going to direct its attention. Um, Ayurveda also directs its attention to several other areas, the tongue, uh, the pulse, uh, and then, of course, uh, the historical data of the client and current uh, questioning. All right, so, uh, so this gives us uh, insight into constitution, tendencies, imbalances, and, um, and it really opens the door for inquiry. So if I see a sign on a person's face, I'm not gonna just conclude, oh, you have cancer or something like that, just from uh, a brief glance. And, and that's not really how I use it, actually, uh, in my clinical practice. Instead, what I do is I'll look at the face and I'll see a, a, a number of different signs or indications. And then I will look at the tongue and I'll see a bunch of signs and indications there. And I'll take the pulse. And I will uh, then uh, take all of that data and information and use that uh, to direct my questioning so that I'm asking uh, efficient questions. And, um, and so it's more like from the face, you get a hunch of something and then you, uh, you almost like the way Sherlock Holmes is, you know, looking for evidence, and then you uh, you get um, uh, some indications of something, and then you inquire about it. You don't just conclude, and that's uh, that's important. Uh, so, uh, you know, the so looking at the face and interpreting it can seem a bit uh, mystical and magical, but it's really just a common sense approach. And I'm gonna I'm gonna present the rationale behind the, the signs so that you, uh, you understand them. Um, and this we've already, we've already talked about. We're gonna look for acute imbalances as well as chronic patterns. So chronic patterns are gonna reveal themselves in the skin and also in the chronic emotional, chronic emotional patterns reveal itself on a person's face. Uh, just in the, you know, a, a, a crease or, or wrinkle here or something like that can indicate chronic emotional patterns and we'll see that. All right, good. Some of the observations uh, in this talk are confirmed through scientific research. Some of them are speculative based on my clinical experience and the clinical experience of, uh, of others. And, um, and where I'm speculating, I'll put out a little SP uh, note on the slides, just so you know that this is anecdotal evidence as opposed to double blind, you know, uh, controlled study, that kind of thing. All right. Uh, so it's important that, uh, that we admit anecdotal evidence, uh, but uh, because I think it is relevant and again, rational, but, um, but we also know that if we uh, can produce uh, uh, you know, gold standard scientific research data, that that is more certain, right? Uh, so yeah, there we go. Uh, a, few, a few other things too, is that plastic surgery, sculpting your eyebrows, putting on fake eyelashes, getting Botox injections, wearing makeup, using lotions to moisturize your face, that all of those things, if your client's doing that, it will obscure your ability to accurately assess 
what's going on on their face. So you have to just be on the lookout for that. Often uh, when I see a client, I will ask them, I will say, oh, that person's face looks very oily. And if, um, and, and so immediately I don't conclude that they ha have an oily constitution. Instead, what my conclusion is, uh, what, I, what I'll do is I'll ask them, do you use lotion? And, and I'll, again, I, I want to make sure that I'm, uh, I'm accurate. We're going to look, we're going to also take into account the temperature of the day, the season, a, a recent sunburn, or whether a person has had a good night's sleep, uh, their stress level currently, what they've recently eaten. All those things will alter a person's face, and especially the skin and eyes. Uh, so in the winter, a person's going to look more pale. In the summer, they're going to look more red. So you have to discount that. Uh, when you're examining uh, the photo. All right, so first we'll talk about constitution and um, uh, by looking at the face shape. So vata people. Vata is the constitution characterized by deficiency and, um, and also uh, thin fluids. So uh, let's see here. I don't want those black boxes to cover up the edge here of this photo. There we go. Um, the thin fluids and, uh, that result from uh, vata deficiency tend to make uh, a vata person long-limbed. And, um, uh, and so you see that vata tends to be long and lean, and that's even reflected in their face. They tend towards a, a, a thin, long face, uh, and sometimes with asymmetry. Vata tends towards irregularity. Here we see a classic uh, pitta shape of the face where the forehead is wider than the chin. And um, Pitta's are as hot headed. They got a lot of blood moving up to the brain. Um, and uh, that's reflected in the face shape uh, that, the, uh, that there is uh, more uh, growth and development in the skull than uh, on the lower portion of, of the face. And so that's just a very typical Pitta shape is wide forehead and thin chin. There are other uh, ways in which this person has a pitta face as well. We'll get through that. Uh, pitta kapha, or a person who is, uh, pitta, by the way, is, the, is a sort of fiery constitution. Um, and then we have pitta kapha, which is a sort of nuance where uh, we have heat and also uh, excess, right? So vata was deficiency, and that looks like thinness. Kapha is the constitution that's more stocky and um, uh, uh, sturdy and well-nourished, right? And in between um, is pitta, which is more hot. And so in a pitta kapha constitution, we have the excess of nourishment, uh, but with plenty of heat. And that, uh, here we see Arnold Schwarzenegger, and uh, that gives good musculature, that tends towards uh, the develop, uh, development of good, strong muscles. And so you see a more square face. Uh, the face is finely chiseled, but not due to the thinness of vata. Uh, and a uh, pitta, especially pitta kapha face, is not going to be as gaunt as a vata face. Here's a more kapha face, right? You see that the skin is thicker, creamier and the face is uh, more rounded, uh, that the um, widest part of the face here is really at the uh, cheeks level, not at the forehead uh, level. The face is wide. So this has a more rounded face and generally have a hardier B for a larger physique. Here's another example of a kapha face, sort of white moon-shaped face. And, uh, uh, that, and also you notice the paleness there well-nourished blood makes the skin creamy. I mentioned that a few minutes ago. Um, and slower metabolism makes the surface of the skin cool. And that causes capillary beds to uh, vasoconstrict. And with the reduced blood flow, you get a more pale looking face. All right, so the blood tends to be more in the core and less on the surface in a kapha person because of the cooler metabolism. You could see the same effect in January. Right now we're in August. Um, the temperature is starting to cool down a bit, and you can start to notice the face is less red than it was in June and July. Uh, and that trend will continue till we get to January, when everyone will have more of a pale face 
because of the constriction of the capillary beds. You can see here that uh, the face is more triangle uh, shaped or pear shaped where there's uh, where it's wider at the base than at the top. Um, and that uh, is a classic, you know, that kind of uh, shape as opposed to that. Uh, that kind of shape is uh, typical of kapha. And you can see the wideness of the neck here, a bit of a double chin, uh, you know, the just generally all around sturdier. And again, it's, uh, you know, it can be a, you know, a little bit of, you know, what is the mechanism by which people with well-nourished blood tend to have uh, 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 a pear-shaped face? Um, we can speculate on the cause. And, uh, and I think that in general, kapha people tend to have tapering features, tapering arms, tapering legs, and the head as well. And we speculate that is because their blood is thicker. Their blood is thicker uh, due to the um, concentration of fats, sugars, and proteins in the blood makes the blood a little bit more viscous. And that in turn um, creates uh, circulatory problems, right? Because viscous thick blood is hard to circulate. And so the limbs become shorter, stockier, and tapering. And that includes the head. All right, if we go uh, specifically look at the forehead, the forehead, the lack of fat um, can make, uh, in a vata person, a deficiency constitution makes the skull seem like it's protruding, right? You can really, when you look at the forehead and at the cheeks, you really see the thickness of the skin there. So we can see vata has thin skin and not, uh, not much fat to cover the skull. So you see the bones are more protruding. Uh, Pitta will ha likely have a large forehead with receding hairline or widow's peak, and it'll be more oily. That heat that Pitta has expresses itself as a more oily uh, complexion. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and Kapha will have an often solid, heavy um, uh, brow that indicates strong bones. The bones of Kapha in general are larger, more rounded, and blunt. They have good, uh, strong bones. And that can reflect the better mineral absorption that they have from their food. So here we see uh, in the cheeks, uh, uh, this model has sunken cheeks. And, and uh, to an Ayurveda uh, person, those sunken cheeks, uh, Ayurveda practitioner would indicate a strong deficiency. You know, would really wanna nourish uh, this, this person. But I think this model may be doing that on purpose. And you can see even in the lips, there's a kind of pallor there that may be lipstick. Um, you know, but in, as a practitioner, if I had a client that had that pallor on the lips and the sunken cheeks like that, I'd be, you know, immediately wanting to cook a hearty breakfast for them. Uh, so cheeks assessed by the location and size of the cheekbone, as well as fleshiness of the cheeks themselves. And, um, uh, and sunken, uh, cheeks indicate deficiency and, uh, weight loss. So you can see here constitutionally, I don't know how Vata this person is. You know, these cheeks do look fairly substantial. I wonder what her real constitution is. And her lips aren't that thin. Um, so I, I, I think that she's probably not a pure Vata constitution, but has starved herself into uh, the sunken cheek mode. All right, uh, Pitta will have average size cheeks that aren't sunken or puffy. Um, and the cheekbones will be high. So this is, a, this is the same person, by the way. Um, and you see the high cheekbones here, even when they were a child. You see it as in the adult photo as well. All right, kapha cheeks are more rounded. More, again, more fleshy, thicker skin. And uh, kapha holds onto water well. So one of the things that makes kapha kapha is uh, the... Uh, is that they hold on to water. And again, uh, due to the thickness of fluids, it's hard for the kidneys, uh, just because of the way the kidneys work and osmotic pressure, to pull the fluids out of a, out of a kapha's blood. And so they pee less and hold on to more water. And I could see this with my kids. I have six kids. Uh, we live here in the mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. It's a lot of fun uh, getting to be a dad of six uh, six young ones and, uh, and they're all so different and, and also wonderful. 
um, good kids. And my Kafa kids, they, they don't pee that much. And when they do, it's like dark. And my Vata kids, it's like if they have a slice of watermelon, which has diuretic properties, it, 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 it's like they're peeing every 10 minutes. So we can't even have that in the evening. Otherwise, you know, they could wet the bed, right? And, um, and so Vata will pee a lot and run towards deficiency and Kafa holds on to that water as well as the nutrients. And that uh, is reflected in how their tissues are well-nourished. So uh, Vata tends to have a long chin and it looks a little bit more thin or frail or even off center, right? Vata tends towards irregularity. Um, uh, but here you can see a thin uh, chin. And what was this? Let's look back here. So her chin is not that thin, right? So again, I don't think she's pure Vata. She's got the larger eyes and the, and the lips there. I think she's just undernourished. All right, uh, Pitta has good muscle development with little fat. So their features are generally sharp and well-toned. So here you see the sharpness of the nose here, right? And just in general, the eyes, uh, every, uh, she has a, sh a sharp appearance, right? If we compare uh, this face to this moon face here, you could see the difference. Uh, Kafa has a sort of affectionate gaze and Pitta a little bit more of a sharper gaze. We know these things intuitively, but sometimes we fail to recognize them consciously, right? We just don't, we don't notice that we're noticing it, right? But I think everyone already, uh, you know, um, is assessing personality from the way a person looks and, uh, but they can, but we can also improve our ability to do that and, um, and be more conscious of it. Again, we see uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger with that square chin, a chiseled chin and jawline reflect, reflecting the strong bone and muscle development of a person who has both heat and moisture, right? Cold and moisture is not quite as healthy. Uh, hot and dry is not quite as healthy. And cold and dry is the least healthy. So cold and dry is vata. Um, not that all vatas are unhealthy. Some vatas can be quite balanced for their constitution. Um, but cold and dry is vata. Hot and dry is pitta vata. Hot and moist is pitta kapha. That is this um, uh, 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 photo of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And cold and moist is very kapha. And that was the moon face we saw earlier. The bones of the chin can be covered in flesh. Kapha bones, again, are hardy and rounded. All right, let's look at uh, the hair. Vata tends towards frizzy, thin, or dry hair. On the left, we see dry hair. On the right, we see uh, more frizzy hair. And you can even see the long face, right? See how these things are consistent? Long face here. Although this face, she has the full lips that's uh, uncharacteristic of Vata. So people sometimes and typically do have a blend. But you can see this person has dry hair on the left, split ends. And also the lips are quite dry and a little bit pale but we see um, some good coloring in the cheeks. I don't know if that is uh, blush though. All right, another uh, example of pitta hair, which is a receding hairline uh, with that bit of oiliness in a pitta kapha. Pitta kapha men may bald, bald or, or, or earlier due to high head temperature and oiliness of the scalp. And you can see lots of examples of heat just in this photo. Uh, in the rosiness of the cheeks, you see uh, there's some heat. And right here, you see uh, there's just good, good blood flow there, the oiliness uh, to the face. Maybe he's using a moisturizer, um, but uh, the oily sheen on the face also points to heat. Kapha tends to have thick, rich, luxurious hair that's wavy, as in this picture of Oprah. It's often a uh, dark brown uh, color or blonde. You can see lots of Kapha signs here, the thicker lips, more rounded face, although balanced Kapha, right? We don't see, the skin doesn't look too puffy, doesn't look like there's a lot of water retention here. So it seems that, um, Oprah has managed to balance her constitution in this photo. 
All right, facial hair. Vata tends to have less facial hair. And uh, Pitta will tend to have fair or orange Pitta hair. Pitta women may develop more facial hair as they age, as testosterone increases. And Kapha people tend to have thick, fast growing um, facial hair. So where's that? Look at this, right? I mean, this, this, this is probably like after not shaving for 48 hours for this person. For me, this would be like two weeks of not shaving. My brother-in-law, um, it's like that, uh, I don't know if you saw the kids' movies, The Santa Claus, right? Where, he, uh, where the guy becomes Santa and is like, all of a sudden is just beard. He wakes up in the morning, he's got this huge beard. And he tries to shave it off and it comes back an hour later. That's my, bro my, my brother-in-law. And he, uh, he um, you know, his beard grows very fast as a, as a kapha guy. Uh, facial lines. It's natural to develop facial lines as people age. Wrinkles develop as collagen is lost. And that's why we associate wrinkles, more wrinkles with dryness in the constitution, a lack of moisture in the constitution. Already then you would know that kapha being a moisturized constitution will have generally fewer facial lines and vata will have more uh, wrinkles and, a, and, and, and potentially a more rugged uh, look to them. And um, uh, Pitta uh, will be somewhere in between. And so let's uh, see what, uh, what that looks like. Uh, also, I wanna mention that the location where lines develop can give insight into chronic uh, emotional patterns. So if a person's you know, more angry, they're gonna knit their brow or they're, if they're constantly problem solving an analytical type person, probably like me, I probably have a little crease up there, right? Um, being uh, uh, doing a lot of analysis um, in the context of medicine, uh, I can tend to get a little lines above here on the on the eyebrows, and that when you see that in a person, you know that they're a more analytical, thinking oriented uh, person, and uh, and so the location where lines develop can give insight into chronic emotional patterns. Uh, as I said before, vata looks the most weathered due to dryness. Kapha, often smooth, supple, creamy skin that looks young for their age. And pitta, somewhere in between. So horizontal lines on the forehead indicate worry. And worry is classically vata. But in this case, we see the thickness of the skin uh, and puffiness of it, and also the redness. Uh, so this is a, a kapha person who has uh, some anxiety and... Um, probably a pitta kapha person with anxiety and a little bit of heat. You see, I don't even need the whole face to tell a lot about their constitution. And we see this, uh, this strong crease here, right in the center between the two brows. And that's gonna confirm the heat that would make a person more analytical and critical, uh, critical thinking skills. So we see two signs of heat, this long crease between the eyes and the redness um, in the forehead and then, uh, and then we see that the forehead has thick skin and a little bit of oiliness to it. We also, the hair looks quite bushy, the eyebrows as well as the, the hair. So all this is a indication of uh, Pitta Kapha. There you go. There's strong uh, crease lines and that indicate, can indicate some stress in the liver. A person uh, becomes more analytical um, and a little bit more problem solving when heat mixes with something being off in the blood chemistry, right? And uh, I would say my analytical nature comes from the fact that I have thalassemia minor, a Mediterranean hemolytic uh, blood condition that makes my uh, red blood cells die a little too fast. And that keeps my liver revved up and a lot of bilirubin in my blood. So that, that uh, the internal environment of Pitta and my blood leads to a uh, certain um, kind of personality, right? And that's uh, great, uh, a great strength in many um, uh, circumstances, like directing a school, right? You want a sharp person directing a school. Um, and, uh, and in other circumstances, you all draw upon the strengths of other constitutions. Um, and, uh, and that's why it takes a village, right? So 
Uh, so the internal um, state of the blood, and in this case, the stress in the liver can create those creases there. Uh, and um, yeah, there you go. Uh, facial lines on a kapha person, you see the more double chin that points to slow metabolism. Lots of signs of, of a cooling, cool constitution here. One, you see the thick facial hair and beard of this person. This person probably shaved this morning and by five o'clock they've got the 5 p.m. shadow. But look what else we're seeing here. We're seeing the, a lot of water in the skin. Um, uh, the person's a little bit overweight. Uh, and then we see the paleness of the lips here. Doesn't look like there's any lipstick there or any makeup. Um, it looks like this, uh, the lips are sort of small and very pale. So immediately with this client, I'd be strengthening their blood and warming them up. Um, and then I would try to pull fats out of their system with strong bitter herbs. <coughs> Again, look at this. I am looking at one small part of this client and I can you know, kind of read into what's going on in the person's whole body from, uh, from these one signs. And I'm seeing the signs all over, the roundedness of the nose and, 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 and all of that, right? So uh, the fat is well evenly distributed. So it's natural to this person's constitution, not just a recent development. Right. In addition to just being cool, the skin has a bit of uh, greenness to it, and that could be um, an artifact in the photo. So I don't want to draw a strong conclusion there till I see other signs. But I'm definitely going to be looking at stagnation in the liver, uh, making this uh, person's skin have a paler to it. All right, there's your Vata skin. The person looks rugged. Um, you know, we see there is some puffiness in the skin. Uh, at the top here. And that happens as a person ages and uh, their circulation becomes a little more stagnant. You'll start to see some water retention in the skin. And typically, uh, you, know, this, um, you know, this pattern happens as a person ages, but you see it more strongly uh, after a person is in their um, mid eighties. So you can see that the, foot, the feet start to swell a little bit and the skin becomes a little more waterlogged as uh, as the person becomes more geriatric. And yeah, let's see here. I see some people in the waiting room and I can't find my window. Oh, there we go. Hold on one second, let me just let them in. All right, good. Uh, so we see the, 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 the Vata wrinkles, a sort of ruggedness uh, to the constitution, uh, exhaustion, um, although this person, you know, it's not a pure vata. It has good, looks like thick hair. And, and, um, and again, a little bit of thickness to the skin there. So we're not going to conclude just pure vata, the thickness of the lips too. But definitely vata stage of life. And, uh, and also uh, vata tends towards moles and liver spots. So we see two moles on this person's forehead, a liver spot there. That also increases as you, as you age. Uh, but vata tends to have more moles, more liver spots. And that uh, is uh, I generally associate that with deficiency in the liver. Um, you know, although there are some types of moles that I would associate with more fatty liver. Okay, Pitta, uh, people tend to have the most sensitive skin. So uh, of, the, of the three doshas, uh, because they're already hot, their skin it gets vulnerable to inflammation. Uh, their skin tends to have a glowing and bright color that uh, is an indication of their strong metabolism. Their skin flushes easily and may appear red or blush easily, and they're prone to inflammation, rashes, and acne. So here we see some, uh, you can't quite tell whether it's a rash or a little bit of acne that's about to form or what, but we're definitely seeing heat signs in, uh, in this uh, Pitakafa face. All right, the skin may have a yellowish tint. This baby here has jaundice. All of my six in like day two had a little bit of jaundice. We put them um, in the sun um, uh, near a window and the jaundice uh, was gone pretty soon. It's typical for babies as they're, um, everything is kicking into gear that they get a little bit of jaundice, but this baby looks very jaundiced. And, um, and so, you know, maybe it's just a uh, natural postpartum, but you know, this is a baby I would put in the window. <laughs> 
This doesn't look like a newborn. So this baby may have some hepatitis or something like that. Anyway, yellowish tint. Um, I can have a yellowish tint to my eyes, uh, again, because of that hemolytic blood condition where my red blood cells die a little earlier. I get broken down into bilirubin. And then I'll get a little bit of yellowing in the corner of my eyes, which I'm always watching out for as a clinical sign. Uh, any sort of green or black, uh, black color beneath the eyes too can uh, be a sign of gallbladder stagnation. Any kind of yellow or green color, the liver may need support. I was just talking about this person that had a paler uh, right here that looked a bit green, but I don't know whether it's a filter on the photo or what. So I just need a little more information on that person. Um, again, Pitta, the most uh, fair, can have very uh, sensitive, fair skin, as in this Pitta person. Here you see, again, that heart-shaped face where the forehead is much wider than the chin. And uh, this person probably burns easily. This is a Pittavata person, right? Their features are delicate and hot, right? So we're looking at hot and dry, not hot and moist. Pitta skin can be prone to freckling. Here's classic Kapha skin, right? Look at the thickness of the skin. Again, that more rounded moon shape uh, face, uh, the thick copious hair, um, the face here looks more oily and moist. The skin is very creamy. Um, yeah, nice wide chin there. So a kapha constitution. And these also kapha eyes. We'll get to that in a bit. All right. Vata people have thin eyebrows. You can see here in these eyes. Do you see how there's some redness around the eyes here? So if I was seeing this client, yes, they're a Vata client. But, uh, but some pitta heat signs, something is irritating uh, this person's constitution. So I would see, I would be looking to see what kind, what kind, what kind of irritant is, is going on and how can I clear that out of their blood? Maybe they have an immune, autoimmune condition that would be hard to clear. Or maybe it's uh, simply that uh, their diet's just a little off for their constitution and needs a little bit of adjusting. Okay. All right, uh, Pitta will have average thickness eyebrows that will be more blonde or reddish in color. And Kapha, you get the thick eyebrows. Reflecting Kapha's tendency towards thick bones, thick hair, thick lips, right? You see all those, look at that thick uh, uh, wavy hair. Uh, some Kaphas can have a short brow uh, and that can indicate hypothyroidism or hyperglycemia or diabetes, actually. It's a very short uh, brow here. All right, the eye. Let's look at uh, how we're going to assess the eye. First of all, we'll talk about the parts of the eye. The pupil, that's the black dot in the center. The iris, the colorful part. The sclera is the white part. And then um, uh, the, uh, you have the eyelid and eyelashes, eyebrow, this little bit of uh, fatty tissue um, above the lid, but below the brow. All those uh, we can analyze. And I won't go into great detail with, uh, you know, like we will in the course with eye assessment uh, here. But for now, we'll say that the shape of the eye is going to be important to determine constitution. Eye movement. How often is the person moving? Are they steady or are they moving a lot? Uh, that's going to tell you the quality of their nervous system and also the quality of their blood chemistry. Because when blood chemistry is off, the nervous system gets a little scattered. Um, a white, uh, and then when we're looking at the sclera, the white part of the eyes, that's where we can see impurities in the blood. I mentioned just a few minutes ago that uh, the corners of my eyes can turn just a little bit yellow, indicating that uh, uh, higher concentration of bilirubin in the blood. So I'm looking for these tissues that are white so that I can um, see impurities in the blood. Well, what are some, another example of that? Your teeth, right? And, your, and also even your nail beds. So wherever we can find those areas uh, that are white, they're good uh, for us to assess toxins in the blood, impurities in the blood. So if we see a yellow sclera, as I mentioned, I can have that, that in the corner of my eyes, we're gonna assume bilirubin in the blood and pitta ama. And if we see grayness in the eyes, we're gonna assume toxins from the colon or GI tract. Person has lots of gas and bloating. 
And the color and clarity of the iris uh, is an indication of their strength of their metabolism. Look at how uh, these eyes almost seem glowing and electric, right? So Pinta tends towards uh, a very vibrant eye because of that heat and high metabolism uh, and also tends towards a rosier um, skin and lips. Whereas um, with kapha, you don't always see the same vibrancy uh, in the eyes or with vata. There's another pitta with a sparkle in the eye, uh, but uh, less of a sparkle here in the eye because of the lower metabolism. Okay. Vata eyes will dart about, reflecting the hyperactivity of vata. Because there's less fat behind the eye, the eyes are more sunken into the skull and appear smaller in a vata person. So here's uh, good old honest Abe uh, Lincoln with, um, and you see the small eyes. He's vata kapha. So that's an unusual uh, constitution where there is dryness, but strong bone development and uh, thick hair. So this constitution tends to be tall with prominent bones, but not much fat. And you can see he fits that bill. Um, vata eyes may be swollen just underneath the eye, indicating adrenal stress or lack of sleep, as we see in this photo on the left. Now, I just want to draw uh, attention to the big difference between the swelling on the left and the swelling on the right. The swelling on the right is like is bags under the eyes, um, and that is going to be from uh, fluid accumulation uh, due to stagnation, more kapha stagnation. Whereas on the left, this is more adrenal stress. Uh, if you have a poor night's sleep, your eye is going to look like this. And it doesn't mean your circulatory system is stagnant. Uh, vata eyes can have purple just beneath the eye, which I associate with dryness and blood stagnation. So this eye is more moisture with a bit of blood stagnation um, or fluid accumulation uh, due to thick, viscous fluids. This one, the fluids are not thick and viscous, but the uh, constitution is dry and the circulation is a little stagnant, leading to a purple color uh, underneath the eye. Okay, there's dull gray color. This is not actually a good photo of gray colored eyes because this could almost look, this almost looks like a melanoma kind of cancer or something like that. So that that would be a client I would say go to the doctor get that checked immediately. Um, uh, but I, if, let's see if I can find, I don't know if I have a good photo of the sort of grayness of typically in the elderly where there's constipation, you'll see a uh, sort of grayness to the eyes. And if I have a picture of that, I'll, uh, I'll point it out, but that's not a good picture. I'll, maybe I'll change that, uh, that slide. So uh, the Vata iris is gonna be dark brown or, um, or even pale brown, but generally Vata tends towards brown eyes. And, um, and sometimes dark blue that, is, uh, that can indicate cold quality, but not really like pale blue. Like this, these eyes here are not vata eyes. This is a more pitta, pitta or ka. I, I mean, the rest of her face looks uh, pitta to me. So I'm gonna say pitta eyes. All right, and irregularities are common in vata as well. There's a drooping eyelid, cross eye, two different color eyes, et cetera. All right, Pitta's more sharp. This person has more sharp eyes. This person is, uh, you can tell, is a smart person. And she's looking at you and maybe even through you, right? Uh, uh, penetrating gaze. And, uh, and that's, you know, Pitta's contribution to the world, right? Vata um, uh, is very creative and, um, and also um, uh, can also be like very graceful, like your ba ba ballerinas are, are Vata's. Pitta is more of analytical. Uh, there's the yellowness in the eyes. This person is, is strongly jaundiced and may have you know, alcoholic cirrhotic liver disease or something along those lines. Uh, we can even see that, uh, that um, uh, the skin here is darkening a bit and that can uh, also be uh, happen with liver stress. All right, bloodshot sclera will show allergies and other inflammatory conditions. 
pitta, uh, pitta eyes, as I mentioned before, are sparkling, bright, glowing eyes, often light blue or green um, or pale brown. The heat sort of burns up the color. There you go. There's Kaf, large, affectionate Kafa eyes. This is a popular Indian actress. And you can see that there's fat behind the eyes, which makes the eyes protrude out a little bit. They're not as deep set as Abraham Lincoln's eyes. And, um, uh, and you can see various other Kafa features in this uh, person's glaze. gaze. And it's less piercing and more affectionate. Large, oval-shaped eyes. Kafa tends to have more thick eyelashes and a bright white sclera as well. So you look at this previous photo, you see that the sclera doesn't have any impurities in it. It's a bright white. Kafa tend to have uh, um, larger white, health, very healthy looking teeth as well. All right, the iris may be dark brown or blue in, um, in Kafa. But because of the nourishment, there's plenty of pigment, pigmentation in the, in the eyes. You're not going to see a dull brown color in a kapha person's eye. The ears of a vata person will look more cold and bluish or pale. Pitta, the ears will be more red and warm to the touch. Uh, kapha will have larger ears. And uh, the puffy earlobe can create a little crease uh, that can indicate high cholesterol. In the ear, this one doesn't really have a crease. Um, I don't know. I don't think I have a photo of that. Uh, longer lobes are considered a sign of intelligence in Chinese medicine, but I think that is simply because as a person ages, their ear lobes get longer, so you have more wisdom when you're older. The nose is made of cartilage and it grows throughout a person's lifetime, and um, and so. Uh, a more moist constitution is going to have a more um, uh, larger nose and vata, which tends towards dryness, will have a small, thin nose. Uh, Pitta may have a red tip to the nose. Kapha will have a broad septum. Um, let's see. Oh, I don't have pictures of Kapha noses here. Let me jump back here. But you see here, uh, her nose, these noses are both a little bit more broad. And uh, this nose is not that broad. Uh, but Kafa tends to have a more skinnier nose. And um, yeah. Okay, so lips are a window into the blood. So uh, as, a, as the sclera and teeth are a window to uh, impurities in the blood plasma, the lips tell you about the strength of the red blood, uh, the, the red blood cells called Rakta Datu in Ayurveda. So lips can, you can, by looking at the lips, you can see if the person's anemic or if they're cold or warm or, or whether they have a heat condition. So this lip on the right looks very bright, a little too bright, and there's redness around the lip. So this is an excess of heat. And on the right, we see a lot of cold. It looks like there's some lipstick here, but I think you get the point. Lips can also reveal emotions. Uh, vata lips are more thin, dry, and pale. Now, this person may not have a vata constitution originally, but they're in vata time of life, and the lips have been got, been gotten thinner, and um, and they tend to vata lips tend to have more pale, be more pale as well, reflecting the cold and dry qualities of vata. Pitta lips uh, tend to be more red, more lustrous, um, not quite as thin. These lips look thin because the person has tension uh, in, uh, in their face, which is common for Pitta to have a little more tension. And then you see the broad, full Kapha lips. Here's Marlon Brando. And, um, and he, uh, the broad lips, the oily constitution, there's the high cheekbones, the square-shaped face, right? Good muscle development in the neck there. All pretty impressive constitution altogether. Dry, flaky lips in a kapha constitution can indicate candida or a fungal infection. Kapha people tend to have more relaxed mouths as well. Pitta is the one that holds a lot more tension in their mouth. All right, good. Uh, so we've gone over how to assess the various features 
of a person's face and uh, what that might indicate constitutionally. Uh, and so um, uh, I think that is a, a great skill uh, to develop, uh, one that we'll expand upon in our course, uh, learning more about how to see kidney conditions and other things um, uh, on the face and more about skin assessment uh, and the other diagnostic tools that Ayurveda offers as well. Uh, so if you like to study this kind of thing um, and you're interested in that, uh, which I think is a great, noble, and worthy uh, study, right? The study of health and also improving your perception uh, and, and understanding of clients, which I think Ayurveda offers a really great skills in that area, um, then uh, you might consider uh, professional certification in, uh, in Ayurvedic medicine. And uh, if you are interested in that, our classes start in nine days. Uh, so uh, now's the time. And um, I wanna thank all of you and appreciate all of you for coming to today's presentation. Uh, just, you've learned a mountain of information uh, today already, just in this uh, last hour presentation. And uh, people always say health is, con uh, disease is contagious, but health is also contagious. As you learn more about health, and you learn more about how to heal yourself and how to understand and see people around you, um, you uh, will uh, be healing your community and improving quality of life for people around you. Uh, the, some of the greatest minds of all time have gone to study uh, um, uh, health and, uh, and philosophy, which uh, is, uh, helps us uh, all, the whole human community, to have a better quality of life and, um, and to know how to be in this world, right? Uh, so the great uh, important uh, things to, uh, for self-improvement and to improve humanity. And, uh, and so it's a great thing that you came today to learn. And I hope that you can use this information in your personal, uh, in your personal life. And I hope to have an opportunity to study with you. I'll open things up for, uh, for questions now. So if anyone has a question, feel free to um, un, uh, unmute your line and ask over voice. And uh, I see people uh, uh, writing in a thank you. Uh, lots of thank yous. And I, I'm, I'm grateful to be of service and to offer uh, this free presentation and, and in general to offer um, uh, great information about Ayurveda. We're gonna do an intro to our courses on, uh, on Monday. Uh, if you'd like to come to that, uh, you, uh, you can. I'll put an announcement on that. And also uh, next week, I'll be sending you a, another snippet from the herb course on ashwagandha. And uh, looking at ashwagandha from a botanical perspective, it'll be uh, an introduction to the botanical features of ashwagandha. And you'll really get to meet and know that herb. And, uh, and then in the course, uh, we'll discuss them. Uh, we'll continue that with the medicinal properties of it. Anyway, that'll be an interesting video if anyone wants to check it out. And John. I will post a recording of this. Uh, so I see people asking. I will uh, send out the recording when I uh, send out the newsletter tomorrow announcing the intro. Good, good. So some people are asking what the price is of the courses. The two-year fundamentals course is, uh, is $6,999. That's $3,500 a year for a full year of study. Uh, so very accessible. Um, and, um, you know, for uh, in terms of what you get, huge value. And, uh, and you will become, we will uh, train you. And by the time you graduate, you'll have a fully functioning uh, clinic. And uh, we'll walk you through every step of developing your clinic in addition to uh, teaching you uh, all the information you need to help your clients. And, uh, and that uh, you'll get tons of clinical experience as well as uh, training in that, uh, in that program. Uh, so that we also offer two specialization courses in Ayurvedic herbs and uh, mastering Ayurvedic digestion and nutrition. So many of our students will take all four of those courses. And uh, you do not have to finish any anatomy class before taking our courses. We will offer you uh, a, a ton of anatomy naturally as we go through uh, the program. And yeah, 
yeah. So yeah, and today's talk is a bit was a bit fast. It's always good to slow down uh, and all that. Uh, we did cover a lot of material, um, and hopefully, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that you that you learn, um, you know, you can try to memorize it. You can watch the replay, get more out of it when you watch the replay. But also, the next time you see a person who has that feature, it's you're just going to remember it at that time too. So uh, because it's hard to like not. Once you get that intuitive understanding, uh, you know, you will, um, it's hard to like, you know, forget it. It's like riding a bicycle in a way. It's hard to not know common sense once you have heard it. And uh, yeah, so the other two one-year courses, the specialization courses are 4,499. So good, one person saying, wow, you nailed my face at 71 years old. I'm normal. All right, good. <laughs> but can I still make improvements working on it? Yes, absolutely, you can. Uh, I am 48 years old. Uh, you asked how old am I? I'm 48. And um, uh, yeah, so, and I, I'm still making improvements. I, I, every, you know, three months, I learn radically new things about how to take care of myself. It's amazing. Yeah, the two years course is the health counselor course. And then um, uh, our students can advance to, uh, uh, Ayurveda practitioner level by taking the herb course and another course uh, that we offer, uh, that we will be offering in uh, the ancient texts. All right, good. I'm looking at these chats to see if there's any other questions. Are the classes recorded or do you have to attend live, S and Margaret? Um, uh, the everything is recorded in our program. So you can attend online. Our students tend to be, uh, you know, they tend to uh, have very busy lives. Uh, many of them are leaders in their community. They may be medical doctors. Uh, they may be um, busy moms uh, uh, with uh, several kids like my wife. <laughs> and and um, uh, our, but our students just tend to be go-getter folks that have busy lives. And so we are, and that's the kind of student we are aiming to attract. Right, we are looking for uh, those go-getter students that really want uh, to make a difference in public health and uh, have that uh, mental capacity to do so as well. And um, and so we're catering to uh, busy folks, and um, and we have a, a flexibility in the program. If you have a family vacation that's planned, uh, you don't have to cancel it if you sign up for the course. Uh, we have a flexible extension policy. We record everything. Uh, you won't miss a single thing. So uh, Rashmi asks, which courses for all diseases cure and prevention of herbs for diseases? So uh, the fundamentals course discusses the entire uh, theory of Ayurveda, and then we apply it in a clinical context. Ha having said that, uh, when you graduate from the fundamentals course, it's like you have a solid foundation in a holistic medical model, right? What's w missing from Western herbalism is a medical model, right? I mean, you, they kind of borrow the modern Western medicine, but that's throwing out 2,400 years of development of biocharacteristics medicine. Greek medicine, Chinese medicine, um, Unani Tib, which is just means Greek medicine in Arabic, and Ayurveda, uh, where the uh, form of medicine the entire world practiced from uh, like 400 BC until, uh, until the uh, 1650s, maybe early 1800s is the kind of phase out process. Uh, when modern biochemistry uh, was invented, but for 2,400 years, the entire, all of Eurasia and North Africa practice uh, these biocharacteristics medicine traditions. Greek medicine, TCM, um, uh, you know, Chinese medicine, Unani, Tib, and Ayurveda are all just, you know, it's very similar uh, systems, almost identical uh, uh, approach, therapeutic approaches to the body, so, uh, but practice in the context of a different cultural uh, tradition. And so, um, uh, and so, uh, what that what these old systems offer is a uh, is a um, an approach to the body that is very natural and very holistic. So when we say holistic, we don't just mean taking herbs instead of pharmaceuticals. We mean a method of assessing a whole person, uh, diagnostic tools, and a whole medical theory that's based on something very natural. Uh, and that's what Ayurveda uh, gives you. So it's uh, what's different between taking 
the fundamentals to your course and say an, an herbal course is, uh, is that you get uh, the whole medical model that was the dominant model for 2,400 years. And, um, and then, uh, so that's what you learn in that whole two-year course. And then uh, you, um, what you want to do is really understand all the tools in a more in-depth way. So that's what the herbalist uh, course is for. So we, we, in that herbalist course, we're not just teaching you herbs. We're teaching you how to be an herbalist, right? It's a difference between a person who knows how to cook a recipe and a chef. And, uh, and so that uh, course, which is going to be using the, um, uh, the medical theories from uh, Greek medicine, Chinese medicine, and Ayurveda uh, to analyze herbs using that biocharacteristics tradition, uh, we, that's an incredible course and in synthesis. Uh, uh, there's nothing like it out there, and um, and that is, uh, uh, you know, very. Um, we're very, just very excited to offer that as part of the continued ongoing training. And then we also have uh, the Mastering Ayurveda Digestion Nutrition course, uh, which we've been running for 15 years now. And uh, so that is, that's just an uh, Rashmi. You were asking uh, which course is for all diseases, and yeah. Um, who teaches our courses? N a number of different practitioners. Our faculty is listed on the website. Who put together the curriculums? A team of Ayurvedic practitioners. Our faculty includes uh, Indian trained BAMS uh, graduates, and it includes uh, uh, people who have training in Western medicine. Um, it includes uh, people who have uh, decades uh, of teaching experience in Ayurveda, and, but every one of our teachers is, call, is called to teach. So um, we're not just looking for the most knowledgeable person. We're looking for great teachers when we're building our faculty. I have a calling to teach. I graduated from Harvard with a degree in mathematics, but, I, but my calling is not to you know, just sit in a room and uh, work on equations all day. Um, it is to teach. I've always been a teacher. Um, I, uh, I was called, I was, um, one of the only undergraduates in my class uh, to be offered a teaching fellow position uh, at, my, at Harvard when I was um, an undergrad. I continued teaching in the Harvard Extension School after I graduated as a teaching fellow, uh, you know, taking a supportive role to, um, to the professor of the course. And, um, and, uh, and I've been in a teaching role ever since my entire life. So it's a call teaching is a calling. So you don't just want a knowledgeable Ayurveda person, you want a great teacher. And you want a person who's the person who's directing the school to have knowledge of pedagogy, tech, teaching techniques. Uh, when you're doing homework in our courses, it's not just like, hey, did you um, happen to remember what you saw on page five in the text? No, we use active learning methods to ask thought provoking questions that require you to use the, model, the, the information and engage with it. And, um, and that really cements in the, um, your ability to use that information with your clients after you graduate. Uh, so uh, great, great pedagogy is essential uh, to uh, a program. And you just wanna make sure if you're gonna invest two years that, um, that you're in investing it with, a, you know, with a school that, uh, that, that is capable of, uh, of great education. So um, yeah. So uh, what types of organizations have accepted the certifications? So Diana, most Ayurveda practitioners go into private clinical practice or they'll team up with other holistic professionals or they might uh, team up with a yoga studio or several yoga studios. Uh, but essentially, the, uh, the, because Ayurveda is an unlicensed profession, it's legal to practice uh, in the United States uh, but it has the same um, status as sort of a health coach in the eyes of the law. And, um, and so it's not a certification that has government uh, recognition. And, um, uh, and I think there's a good case for why, uh, why Ayurveda should remain unlicensed. Uh, but part of what we train our students is how to um, uh, build their clinical practice and how to work with others. And one of the main things uh, Diana, that I want to uh, say to you is that uh, it's really specializations uh, that uh, really help the public engage with you. So 
clients wake up in the morning, they have a particular problem. They want to know who the best person is to solve that. And so if you specialize in gallbladder disease and you run in your town and you've like been specializing in gallbladder disease for seven years, people are going to come to your practice because they're looking for, if they have a gallbladder problem, they're going to come to you. And, uh, and that's just because your dedication to the specific problem that they have is going to be highly motivating to them. And, uh, and then you see that's the way meta, Western medical doctors promote themselves as well. You're driving down the highway, you see a billboard for a doctor. They never say, hey, I'm a great doctor, come to my practice. They always say, I've been running a diabetes clinic for, for 10 years and I've seen 4,000 patients. And, you know, I, uh, and, um, and our patients, you know, we're, we're known for offering expert diabetes care. And then if a person has diabetes, they're like, maybe I'm gonna call those guys, right? And they're not even gonna know what, uh, you know, where the person uh, graduated, but they're, but, um, or, you know, or even know what their degree is, but they are going to uh, be highly motivated because of the expertise that you have in their particular area. You want a great school so that you have the clinical competency uh, but your clients often won't know uh, or, or have any basis for even evaluating, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the school you came from. Uh, so it's important for you that you choose the, the right school. Right. Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're, uh, I've, been, I've been asking answering questions now, Chandra. Chandra's asking, you know, I thought this was about face, <laughs> face recognition. So, yeah, if you missed the face recording... Um, uh, or a face presentation. I'll send the recording in the in the newsletter if you're coming in coming in late. Any other questions? Yeah, and Chandra, I think people are asking about the course because uh, the sign up is in nine days, uh, so people have nine more days to uh, to register. So a few folks who are interested, you know, we're asking asking last minute questions about it, and I'm happy to uh, stay on the line and answer any questions. Yes, we do have payment plans for the course. Uh, $250 a month for the fundamentals course, uh, which, you know, for $250 a month, um, you know, probably less than the grocery bill, you could have this uh, information and knowledge. Any other questions I can help with? Great, great, uh, great to get your questions uh, and uh, great to see uh, a, a good turnout and so many people interested in face assessment. I think it's an awesome skill uh, to, uh, to get to know the folks around you and, uh, and to help your clients. Uh, so I look forward to sharing more. Uh, again, we'll have a course intro Monday night. And, uh, but I'm gonna also say to people, if you wanna register, uh, I would register sooner rather than later text me or call me. I'll give you my, uh, my cell phone in the chat. It's 828-785-8213. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, you know, registering sooner, you get to prepare, uh, you know, get to take the next nine days to prepare for starting the course, uh, including just ordering the books and, you know, go, getting the orientation acquainted with the technology and all that. So, um, you know, if uh, uh, I, I definitely recommend uh, folks sign up uh, before the weekend's over um, uh, and get that head start. Call me uh, if you have any questions. I'm happy to answer them. Uh, you're also welcome to come to the course intro on Monday night. Yeah. Great, good. So I'm going to send out the re recorded video from today. And uh, you'll see that in your uh, e inbox uh, tomorrow. Okay. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Uh, many blessings to you. And, um, and I look forward to uh, our times together. Take care.